Okay. I think we're all set. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so we will just go ahead and jump in. So you are here at the Basics of Preserving Food Safely webinar. So this was designed by CSU Extension and we have been putting out research-based information on food preservation for a number of years. And we have several different kinds of presentations that go along with this. And I would, what we're gonna be doing today is just doing a real basic Sorry, overview of some of the methods but not all of them, okay? So I just wanna make sure that we all have our, um, our microphones muted if you can. Um, and so we don't have any cross, um, cross noise while I'm presenting, okay? So my name is Amber. I am the Family Consumer Sciences Extension Agent with Larimer County. And I've been in Larimer County um, working for Extension for about four years. So um, I'm just super excited to bring this information to you today. So before we even jump into the types of food preservation, I just want to start with a little bit of food safety um, while we're thinking about gathering all the materials before we even begin. So what's really important and what's different about food that you're going to preserve for later use, you know, your long term food storage, is that it really needs to be the best of the best quality. Um, so you don't want to purchase any product that is bruised or has damage on it, um, because that is not going to stand well in preservation. That might work for other things. And I fully, you know, use that in some types of cooking, but it's just not the best for food preservation. Okay, so even when you're at the market, um, just do think of a few different things when you're there. You want to make sure that you've got your hot foods like your roasted red peppers separate from your cold foods. You don't want to put that in the same bag together because that is definitely going to affect the quality by the time you get home. Okay, if you're purchasing meat or poultry products from the market as well, you want to make sure that those are separate from your fruits and vegetables as well. Okay. And then when you're at the market, it's important to keep that produce as good of condition as possible before you get ready to preserve it. So you wanna make sure that you're going directly home with the product that you've brought, that you're either bringing a cooler or some kind of a, you know, like a insulated bag with ice or gel packs on it and keep that cooler out of the sun. Now we've had some really hot days lately. And so it's really important that you're getting that food into refrigeration within two hours. But if it's 90 degrees or above, you really should be getting it into refrigeration within one hour. And then when you are home, you're ready to start getting working with your product. Just want to, you know, take a few extra food safety precautions. Always make sure that your hands are thoroughly washed. Make sure that your produce that you're going to be eating or preparing is thoroughly washed. Um, cut away those bruised areas. If you maybe have one or two, that's okay. Um, but make sure that you're scrubbing your produce with a clean brush. You're using clean, cold running water. And then if you're using or preserving greens, make sure that you're rinsing those greens leaf by leaf. I know it's a very tedious process, but it's so easy for things like aphids um, and uh, spider webs, that kind of thing, for to be on the produce that you really can't see when it's in that bundle. Okay, so we're going to be talking about four different methods today. There are more, but we just don't have time to cover all in this Lunch and Learn. So um, like I said, there are later classes available if you have interest. So we'll just go ahead and get started. So freezing is one of my favorite food preservation methods, actually. So it's one of the simplest and least time consuming ways to preserve food. What's interesting is you're not really killing germs when you're freezing food. It can slow growth down, but it doesn't actually kill things. So we, there's a number of things that we need to do to make sure that the product that we're freezing for later use is kept in the best condition possible. And what we're doing is we're gonna be controlling for enzymes. We're gonna be controlling for air getting in. We don't want ice crystals getting in and we don't want evaporation of moisture of the product that we're freezing either. So there's some things that we can do to make this process go as smoothly as possible. So it really can be kind of come down to packaging, right? You don't want to use packaging that has um, any holes in it. So things like um, 
butcher paper. If you have some um, steaks or that kind of thing, put in butcher paper, put that away in the freezer. That's not going to save and freeze nicely for you because the moisture is going to leak out of the product. And then any kind of moisture in, or you know flavors or smells or anything in the freezer is going to get into it. So you don't have any kind of protective barrier. So you want to make sure that you're using airtight, moisture and odor resistant products that are durable, that are leak proof, that aren't going to crack, and they're easy to use. They're easy to seal and they're easy to label. So you can see here, there's some products that are perfect for the kind of thing that we're talking about. You've got freezer paper, freezer bags, freezer containers. Um, you don't want to use things like reusable plastic dairy containers. So you see here, there's like an example of sour cream. You don't want to use like yogurt containers, wax, paper, um, anything like that, because it's just going to expose your product to everything else that's in your freezer. So you also need to consider when you're freezing the amount of headspace that you're leaving. So let's say, for instance, you are going to be freezing um, some peaches um, or you're going to be freezing soup. So there's two different varieties of things you can use. A soup is going to have a lot more liquid in it and you need to be able to allow for headspace because as that liquid freezes, it will expand a little bit. So if you fill it up right to the brim and then close it, it actually can break your seal and you won't be able to um, keep a good sealed product in it if that <laughs> happens, okay? So you want to make sure that if you're using uh, um, the pint jars, like the glass pint jars or quartz, and it has a wide opening, that you're leaving about a half inch to an inch of headspace. If you're using the narrow um, opening of the pint jars or the quart jars, you can see that head, that headspace is a little bit different, okay? But there's some products like green beans I ha you know, have here or berries you're not going to have that liquid in there, so you don't really need that headspace. Okay, so if you're freezing fruit, right now is such a fantastic season to freeze fruit because we have an abundance of it right now. So many different kinds of stone fruits and berries, they're just all so perfect. So if you get a great deal on something, here's some different things you can do with it. So you can actually create a syrup pack that has um, a sugar solution to it. You can do a lot of syrup or you can do more. Um, we have um, in the email that I sent you, um, I'll just kind of stop for a second and let you know, I gave you a whole list of different fact sheets for different types of food preservation. So I've got freezing fruit, freezing vegetables, dehydrating and canning all there. And each one of those things is gonna give you a step-by-step -step instruction on how to preserve that kind of food, okay? Um, so this is a very brief introduction, but you have so many more resources available to you. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later, okay? Something else you can do is tray pack. And this is one of my favorite things to do if I have something like berries, which are in season. What you can do is just spread it right on a tray, like you see here, a little bit, you know, spread apart so it's not all clumped together. You put that tray in the freezer for about four to six hours. And then once those are frozen individually, you can pop those off with like the back of a spatula and then put those into a freezer bag. Um, and then that's basically the same way that you're getting your frozen fruit in a commercial setting from like a grocery store. You open the bag and it's nice and loose and everything's broken apart. This is the right way to do it. But if you were to just put the fruit straight in the bag and then freeze it, what's gonna happen when you want to use it? You have one solid block of frozen, you know, whatever you have, frozen strawberries. And it's not really easy to break apart and to portion out. Um, so this one extra step can really save you a lot of hassle. So something that's important to consider when you are um, pre-treating your fruit is um, make sure that you're using some kind of a solution to help with discoloration during freezing. Because you know if you cut something open, say a peach or an apple, something like that, you leave it on the countertop, it's gonna brown. The same thing is gonna happen in the freezer. So if you were to use something like vitamin C, uh, citric acid, lemon juice, ascorbic acid mixtures, um, these will prevent that darkening. 
um, and they will also preserve the quality of the product as well. It'll prevent things from getting really mushy. Um, and all of those avail are available at a local grocery store or hardware store if you're looking for that product. Now, pretreatment of vegetables is a little bit different. You're not gonna use the acidic solutions to do that. Um, all you need to do for vegetables is to blanch. Um, so blanching is, it helps with that freezer process because it starts the steps towards stopping that enzyme activity. So what you're basically gonna do if you're going to blanch a vegetable is chop it into uniform size, put it into a boiling water bath, depending on the type of vegetable you have, there's a fact sheet with the chart to show you what the product is, how long it needs to be blanched for. So let's say you have carrots and it's two minutes. You put those carrots in the boiling water, you take it out and you put it in an ice water bath, a large bowl with ice next to it and water. You, that actually stops the cooking and then it's ready to freeze. So you drain the product, dry it off, and then you can immediately put it into freezer bags or freezer containers um, for you. Now, something that I love to do um, with um, different types of products is to use ice cube trays. Now, you can do this with um, a number of different products. So you can see here, I've got some photos of herbs and pesto um, that are made using ice cube trays. So you make your product, put it in the tray, let it freeze for a couple of hours, maybe four hours or so, and then you can crack that ice cube tray open, put your pesto <clears throat> into your bags, and then label it. <clears throat> and down below, <clears throat> underneath this photo, <clears throat> you can see here, there is a, just like a, a roasting tray. It's in the lower photo with the pesto, and then also on the left, some people have said pesto cubes can take a really long time to defrost because they're so thick. So some people will put it on a thin layer on a tray, freeze it that way, and then cut it into smaller pieces. And then you only have, you know, maybe half inch of um, pesto. It defrosts quicker, it's more usable. Um, it's just another quick way to preserve something like that. But you can also freeze herbs. So if you've got some really hearty herbs like rosemary, um, sage, thyme, things like that, just like you see here in this photo, you can lay it straight <clears throat> out on a cookie sheet, <clears throat> put it into the freezer, <clears throat> and you are good to go. Okay, I'm going to pause here and admit someone else. And I am hearing some feedback from someone. If you could please um, mute your mic, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, hang tight with me for just a moment. Oops. Sorry about that. Going backwards here. <clears throat> okay. Hold on for just a moment. <clears throat> okay. All right. So you've got your product in your bags, ready to go into the freezer. And we always recommend making sure that you label your product um, with your name, your date, your quantity, and any added ingredients. Um, sometimes freezers can get really full and it's really hard to determine what you have and when you put it in um, your freezer. So in order to get the product used up in the right time, making that quick labeling of it for yourself is so beneficial for you. Now you can go beyond storage time recommendations for these products a little bit longer, but just be aware that the longer they're in storage, you're gonna reduce that quantity, that quality, excuse me. It's not gonna become unsafe immediately on the day after of three months, but your quality will um, become reduced as the longer it is in the freezer, okay? All right. So now we're gonna talk about dehydrating. So dehydrating is one of the oldest methods of food preservation. Um, things like dried fruits and dried meats like jerky are really great healthy snacks. Um, but you can also do things like dried 
dehydrated vegetables, which is great for using in cooking later on, like making soups or sauces, soups or sauces or stews. Um, it also is a great thing to use um, when you're um, backpacking or camping or just packing snacks on the go. Um, one of my favorite things <laughs> to dehydrate that I've done since I was probably 12 years old, we had a dehydrator, is uh, apple chips. Um, and I just put either something like cinnamon on them or um, a little bit of lemon juice, like we talked earlier about pre-treating that fruit for freezing, you can do the same thing for dehydrating that will keep that product a little bit longer. So apple chips are really wonderful. Um, peaches also um, and pears. So there's a couple different kinds of dehydrators available on the market. There's actually quite a lot, but we're just gonna talk about two today. So there's two different designs, okay? So the one that you see on the left is a horizontal food dehydrator. Um, these often are um, pretty high powered and they have a lot of um, availability to really um, make your product variable. So what I mean is that the, the airflow is horizontal. So you can see it's going this way and then circulating around. These kinds of dehydrators will often have a lot of settings. That's what I was trying to get to. Um, so they will have temperature control and they will have timers on them as well, okay? Um, and the initial cost could be pretty high for dehydrators, but depending on what you're using them for, you might be able to save quite a lot of money in the long run if you like eating a lot of dehydrated products. So the next one over here is a vertical airflow, the white one. And so either you'll see the heating coil unit is on the bottom, or sometimes it'll be on the top in the lid. And then there's a, a like a column down the center. And so it sends air in a big circle all the way around it. Okay, so the major advantage of that horizontal flow one you see on the left, it reduces the flavor mixture. So you can, reduce, you can do a lot of different kinds of foods in that unit, and you're not gonna get a lot of a lap over of flavor later on. But the vertical airflow is probably not the best picture because there's a lot of different kinds of you know, fruits on here. It's been shown that those are gonna mix a little bit better than the other one. But the one on the right is often a lot more economical. Um, and there's a variety of those that I've used that are all fantastic. And you can get around $50 or so. This one is really interesting. So if you don't have a dehydrator, you could actually use a gas or an electric oven to dry foods. Um, the only thing is that some, of, some ovens will not go down to the temperature that you need to dehydrate food. And that is actually 140 to 145 degrees. That's really the best kind of temperature for dehydrating. Um, above that, it's gonna scorch. So if you're interested in this, Take a look, see what's possible with your oven and make sure that you keep your door open for about two to four inches. If you could prop something open, um, it needs to have that air circulation, okay? And this is obviously not a good time of year, right? To keep our ovens on all day. But if you've got you know, a project in the fall or the winter, um, it might be a good option for you. Now, this is something I love to do. Um, I used to garden quite a bit. Um, I don't really have a large garden right now, but something that I will continue to do is air dry herbs. And that's one of my favorite things to grow. I think I have about 20 different herbs growing right now. Um, and the best thing for, you can do for air drying them is with sturdy herbs, you can just make little bundles, just like you see here in the picture, um, without a dehydrator, without any extra equipment, tying them up, putting them to air dry in a place where they're not gonna be expo exposed to pollution or fumes like in a garage. Um, you can maybe put it in um, like an, a spare bedroom or something like that. Um, that might be a really great spot for you. And it only takes about three to five days for those to dry in those bundles. Now you can also dry herbs that are a lot more tender is what we say, tender leaf herbs like basil, tarragon, lemon bulb, and mint. Um, if they're not dried quickly, you can have some problems with them. So what you can do is tie them up in the bundles and then put a paper bag around those um, to let it dry a little bit slower. 
And then also, if there's any of the seeds that are on the herbs, that will collect in the bottom. So if you're growing herbs just to collect seeds, this is a really great way to do that and dry your herbs at the same time. And just like this picture we had for freezing herbs, you can also actually just tray drying your herbs as well. Um, just spread them out like this a little bit, you know, so they're not all bunched together. You can leave this, you know, out in a place where they're not going to be disturbed for anywhere between three to five days, depending on your home environment. And as soon as they're ready to go, you can, um, you can package them up. Okay, so we have talked about pre-treating our fruits and our vegetables for drying, um, but something that I like to mention is what happens when it's done drying, okay? Um, there's, a, a, I would say, a situation <laughs> in food preservation or in, in drying specifically where the outside of the food cooks or dries faster than the inside. And that basically creates an impermeable barrier on the outside. And so the inside of the food can cause some moisture retention, okay? Um, you're not gonna see that all the time if you're using a food dehydrator, but if you're doing like outdoor solar or sun drying, that's really where you're mostly gonna see it. But sometimes it does occur, depending on what you're dehydrating, if it's a really thick, um, type of product that might happen too. So what we say is once your food is all dry and you put it in a container, you can condition it, okay? So put it in a tightly closed container and then you shake it daily for four to 10 days to equalize any of that moisture that's occurring in your product. Um, if some of that beads of moisture form on the outside, then you can return your food to the dehydrator for further drying. Okay, and that can help with that case hardening as well. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit, but there are some great uses for dehydrated food. I have um, a program called Master Food Safety Advisor Volunteers. And every year during, during our classes that we have for the public, they will make a variety of products to taste. And this is always so much fun to see what they come up with because they just have the most creative ideas. So you can see here for snacks like fruit or fruit leathers or zucchini chips is a great option. Um, or seasonings, you can do herbs or onions. One of the things that I tasted that was just un incredible was there was a pizza jerky and a salsa jerky. And they made both of those products, they pureed them perfectly, and then they made leathers out of it. And then they ended up using those as ingredients for soups and sauces and that kind of thing later on. So instead of having the loose, uh, you know, diff different little particles or chopped up um, varieties, it would be a leather and they could just tear that off and add it to the mixture and then it would um, rehydrate. So there's, just, there's so many different options out there. And that fact sheet that I was talking about does give you lots of great ideas. Okay, I'm going to just take a quick sip here. So on to quick pickling. So I wanted to include quick pickling as a food preservation method because it is such a fantastic way to use produce um, that provides just so much flavor. And it's something that you can do quickly and you can eat it right away and you don't have to store it for later and feel like you need to wait until winter to use it. I feel that way sometimes when I preserve food. So what is quick pickling? Um, you might've heard this also called a refrigerator pickle. Um, and it really just means that you're increasing the acidity of the product to inhibit unsafe organisms from growing, okay? So how do you do that? This is done by adding an acid ingredient such as a vinegar or lemon juice. And really the biggest thing that I wanna point out is that the, any kind of vinegar that you use for pickling must be a 5% acidity. Now there are so many wonderful, delicious vinegars on the market 
but not all of them, especially the specialty ones, are going to be 5% acidity. That range can change. So just be sure whether you're doing apple cider or distilled or red wine vinegar or white wine vinegar or champagne vinegar, any of those, that it's got that 5% acidity for food safety. So you're not growing anything that you don't want to be growing in there, okay? And then the other important step on this is that you want to make sure that you're using equal parts vinegar to equal parts water. There are a lot of quick pickling recipes out there in popular magazines, and these numbers, these ratios of vinegar to acid are all over the place. Um, and so while that might be fine for making a quick pickle and then eating it for a specific meal, you'll often see I see recipes that says chop up an onion and put some red wine vinegar on it. And then that you you cook your meal and then you do that pickled vinegar for the top of your um, for the top of your meal that you eat right then, but it's not for saving for later on. Okay. So how do you make a quick pickle? I'm gonna show you. Um, in the next slide is super easy, okay? This is really all that you need. You don't even need a specific recipe. I'm gonna give you one, but this is really just as, as easy as it is. You wash and prepare your vegetables, um, whatever combination you're interested in. If you have seasonal vegetables that are tender, you know, something like carrots or beans um, that you can cut nice and thin, you don't have to pre-cook any kind of vegetables unless you're doing something like beets, you might wanna pre-boil, but something like green beans or cucumbers or onions, you don't have to do that. You cut them um, and then you select and you measure your seasonings. There's a whole variety, I'll show you a table. You make a brine and then you put your brine over the top of your vegetables and your seasonings and then you let it cool and refrigerate and it's ready to go and you eat them within a few weeks, and that's it. It's so, so simple. And I'm actually going to be doing a demo at the county fair next weekend, I believe is the date, next Saturday, um, to, well, August 6th, I'll just say that. I don't have a calendar right in front of me, um, to show you hands-on, step-by-step this process and get to taste some samples. So what you have here is a table of some just different options for dry herbs and spices that can go really well um, with different kinds of vegetables that you'd like to pickle, okay? So I mentioned the brine, you need to make a brine. So what we're gonna be doing is using equal parts vinegar and equal parts water. If you like a sour brine, you would use a percentage of salt, and sugar, so you can see here, three tablespoons of canning or pickling salt, two tablespoons of sugar for sour brine. And this is for three quarts of packed jars. A sweet brine is obviously gonna have more sugar. And down here, I have a table that is just one pint of product at a time. And I think I've got, yes, I've got a pint here right behind me. I'll just grab it and I'll show you what this looks like. So here's a pint sized jar, um, or excuse me, a quart sized jar, and here is a pint sized jar. So down below you can see, even if you wanted to do just two of these or one of these, that's all you need. It's just a cup of vinegar, a cup of water. You pack your product, your, your vegetable full um, to the top of this, and then you pour that brine and it goes right to the top. It's really perfect measurement. So just one of these at a time. You could even do one of these at a time if you just cut that down in half. Um, and it's just so fun to have some really flavorful pickles in your refrigerator at all times. Okay, so on to canning. This is our last section here. So you've probably heard of canning. What does that really mean? So the the food scientific process that we're doing is we are placing jars in heated or in hot water to a temperature that destroys microorganisms and inactivates any enzymes in that product, okay? Now, when you heat that product and then you later cool it, it forms a vacuum seal, which presents or prevents further spoilage during storage, okay? So that's what keeps that shelf life. And I'm going to take another quick sip. 
So you can see here right on this um, slide, I have the pH scale for you. Okay, so any product that has a pH of zero to seven is considered an acidic food. And then from right at that seven line from seven to 14 is considered an alkaline food. So you'll see here, acidic foods are things like fruits that have fruit juice in them, that have acidic um, qualities to them. And then the low acid things are things like vegetables or dairy or meats, right? So depending on what you want to preserve, that's going to tell you which type of canning is going to work best for you, okay? So you've got two different methods. You have a water bath canner, and that's used for things with acidic foods. So things like fruits, okay? Pickles, jams, jellies, or tomatoes that have been acidified. So think um, even like salsa that has vinegar and uh, lime juice in it. Because those vet that vegetable has been acidified, it's safe to put in a water bath canner. On the other hand, if you want to do things like vegetables, so many vegetables are great um, processed um, for later use, or meat, or poultry, or fish, even if you're a fisher and you want to preserve some of that food, you're going to need to use a pressure canner, okay? Now, the biggest thing that we're doing in home canned foods for, that, for our preservation for later on is preventing botulism and the other overgrowth of bacteria that I was talking about earlier. Now, C. botulinum is really what forms the spores, and then the spores are what make people sick. So if you've heard of um, botulism in things like honey, so you can't serve it, give it to children under one, um, it's that botulism that is that can be <laughs> really um, grown um, in preserved foods if they're preserved incorrectly, okay? So the spores of C. botulinum require high temperatures to be destroyed of 240 or above. Now, you're not gonna get that in a water bath canner. You have to get that out of a pressure canner. So that's, the, again, one of the differences. Um, so you have to use pressure canner for low acid foods. And then the, um, the pressure of a pressure canner is from, is that 10 PSI is pounds per square inch is gonna be 240 degrees at sea level. So you're gonna get that in the pressure canner. So we could go into it and I have a whole class on pressure canning and a whole class on water bath canning. So if you're really interested, we will go into it further in those classes, okay? Now, if you have family that has done canning over the years, over the generations, there are a number of processes that have been used and you may have learned about these, but according to the most late, the latest research, there are a number of methods that are not recommended because they're not safe. So open kettle canning is something where you just, um, you fill it, you cook your product, at the boiling temperature, you're ready to go, you put it in the can or you put it in the jar, you seal it up and then you turn it upside down. You will hear a pop because of the pressure of the food on it and the heat and you think it might be sealed, but it's not actually sealed for long-term storage. Um, it's probably a very short-term seal. So that's open kettle canning. It's not safe um, for long-term. Um, some people have tried ovens, microwaves, dishwashers, electric pressure cookers. Um, these are all not safe. Um, and especially I wanted to speak to electric pressure cookers um, because they're not designed to sustain the temperature necessary to safely preserve foods at home. Okay. Now we're almost about to the end. So just a couple more slides here. I wanted to mention if you're considering water bath canning or pressure canning, I do have separate classes on those. I'd love to have you join us. Um, but if you're ready to jump in or you just you needed a refresher, something that I wanted to mention is that using a reviewed and tested recipe with instructions is so important, especially if you're in Colorado because of our altitude differences. There are a lot of popular press, uh, magazine articles, websites that will have canning recipes that aren't tested um, from 
a university research uh, research um, and so it can be dangerous to you right you don't want to give food to people to your family and to yourself that could make you sick okay so just make sure it's coming from the right spot okay now canning can take a long time so you want to make sure that you're planning for time to can four hours even sometimes and that you're not interrupted um, with kids or dogs or anything like that you need to have that dedicated time and we talked about this selecting your freshest ingredients right and then you'll need to assemble your equipment so we recommend that you don't use any canning recipes that are prior to 1996 and that comes from the national center for home food preservation so if it's before that, um, you can get into trouble with um, methods that aren't as safe, okay? Now we've got a website called Food Smart Colorado um, that has a lot of really great uh, resources there. We also have an app called Preserve Smart, which we've developed that has all of our food preservation resources right at the touch of your fingertips. Say you're at the farmer's market, there's a great sale on peaches. You can go to peaches, you can hit dehydrating or you can hit canning or you can hit um, freezing and it'll tell you right there on the spot what you need to do to be ready to do that, to preserve that product. Um, Ball Blue Book and also the pectin package inserts are really great um, for good solid recipes as well. Okay, so we talked about this already. Planning a little bit of time um, for your canning will really make for a better product. Your whole process is going to be more enjoyable if you just plan for that time and not feel rushed. And then those fresh vegetables, the fresh ingredients also will make a big difference. Um, and I can say that I have absolutely experienced this. I've harvested something directly from a garden, took it in and preserved it, and it tasted so much better than things that I have purchased from a store. Um, it really I can't underestimate that flavor, that quality difference. And then assembling your equipment. So here's just a really quick run through. Um, whether you're gonna do something like a pressure canner or a water bath canner, you'll need a canning rack, you'll need jars and lids, jar lifter, bubble freer, a funnel, a ladle or spoon, a timer, and then kitchen towels. Because when you're taking product out of that hot water bath and putting it on a cold, countertop, you can break those jars. Um, and so having a kitchen towel can be a little bit of a buffer um, for that heat exchange, okay? I know that was super fast, but like I said, we have classes that um, will go over these step-by-step -step with you and give you the opportunity to practice it as well, okay? So one last thing that I want to mention is with the altitude adjustments, um, you need to make sure that you're adjusting for altitude because it's critical for food safety um, when you're preparing these foods. For boiling water bath uh, canning, you need to add time according to the instructions in a tested recipe due to that lower boiling, pour, uh, boiling pour, uh, point <laughs> of water at altitude. And then with a pressure canner, you need to add pressure. Um, and that is due to lower atmospheric pressure at altitude. So that's one thing that really to keep in mind here in Colorado, that there are definitely considerations that you need to make because of that altitude. It can be done, just need to make sure that you're doing it right. Okay, that is it. I felt like I was just running as fast as I could to get to the end of this today, but I shared a lot of information with you. I would be happy to answer any questions. We have a few more minutes left. I can open it up either to chat or if you'd like to open up your mic, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Amber, this is Allison Richards. Mm -hmm. I was wondering when you talked about the vinegar being 5% acidity, what happens? I mean, it can um, if it's 6% or 7%, is that, okay because it's more acidic or you just don't want it to be under five percent so that is a really great um, question my understanding of that is that the measure of acidity has changed over time so a lot of recipes actually use so this actually brings me to an 
it kind of reminds me of another point. A lot of times we don't say, when we say that we don't want to use recipes prior to 1996 is because acidity has changed also in the fruits and the vegetables that we eat today. Um, but also recipes have changed. So say my grandmother's recipe might have called for um, some kind of vinegar. 50 years ago, vinegar was at seven or 8% acidity, and now it's at five. Um, I don't think that you're going to find those numbers higher in the specialty products. I think you'll find the numbers are lower. Okay. And I, I've also seen on some, I think like balsamic vinegar or like, um, I'm trying to think there are some really specialty vinegars out there. They don't even list the acidity on them. So that's just saying you might not want to use that to do pickling. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Do you know any? Oh, and I did want to mention if you are willing, I would love to have you fill out a survey about this class. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Love any tips or suggestions that would make the uh, experience better for you. Also would love to hear what you enjoyed um, and just um, anything else you might recommend. Okay, so what I did is I put a survey in the chat and it probably will take you less than five minutes, just uh, maybe 10 questions. Um, it'll be really helpful for our future programming. Okay, and I do see a question in the chat. This is from Dee. On air drying herbs with brown bags, slide 22, did the photo show there were holes in the bag? Yes, D. I think I may have jumped over that. So if you punch holes in the bag on those more tender herbs like basil, that will allow for the airflow that it needs. So you want some airflow to come in. You just don't want it as fast. So um, I'm thinking like basil specifically, if you were to just hang that up and put it just out, you know, in full air exposure, like with the hardy herbs, it's going to turn brown. Um, but if you put it in that bag, some of that color and quality is going to be retained in an air bag with holes punched in it. Okay, great. All right, so we are at 1245. Um, if anyone has any final questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, if not, thank you for joining this webinar today. It was a pleasure to have you all. Um, I have another, a number of other webinars, lunch and learns, and um, hands-on classes. So please uh, check out our website, and I look forward to hearing from you again. And Margo has a quick question. Oh, the slideshow. Yes, um, if anybody would like to receive the slideshow, I can definitely send that to you. Um, all the information is in the, the fact sheets that I gave you the link to. I will send that to you directly, Margo. If anyone else would like it, you have my email, send me a quick email and I'll send you the slideshow, okay? All right, thanks everyone. Have a great day, bye-bye.